playtime's over because tonight somebody's going to get their ass whooped tonight in here. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Bowling Shoe Handsome for Monday, February 20th, 2012. I'm your host, Kevin McElveney. With me here, as always, the ubiquitous, the intelligent, the insightful, the delightful, Young John. Young John, say hello to the nice people. Well, thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that. Hello, everybody. Welcome. And the welcome mat has been thoroughly laid out, and here we are, Young John, uh, recording just a little bit before the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view. Oh, that's right. That is coming up. Right, but that by the time anyone's hearing this, it will have come and gone. I mean, so. oh, I forgot that <laughs> happened. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one and or bad one. <laughs> <laughs> I was really, I was really surprised with that pay per view. Yes, and here we are, delighted and or horrified by what took place. <laughs> and uh, in fact, so much so that we're not going to talk about it tonight for some can, reason. Can you believe what Daniel Bryan did? I know, that was that was quite a thing that happened. Anyway, uh, so so tonight's topic is going to be about a couple of guys by the name of Vince. But before we get to that, uh, this is the season of Vince, and with the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view having just taken place last night, we are officially in WrestleMania mode. It's going to be a big one. And uh, Young John, not only do we have the return of The Rock this year, and a lot of other uh, great matches uh, looking to be in order for WrestleMania 28, we also have the announcement last week that WrestleMania 29 will be taking place at the Meadowlands. Uh Uh-huh. Really? Yeah. Wow. Up in yeah. North Jersey. North Jersey. North Jersey. So there's that. And there, uh, there is that. Yes, yes. There was a big press conference, uh, you know, representatives from the Giants, the Jets. Just uh, it was it was a big thing. I uh, believe uh, the 450-pound Samoan machine, uh, Chris Christie, was there. <laughs> <laughs> He's not Samoan. I just had to make him sound tough and not just fat. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, he's just fat. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So he was there. It was kind of a kind of a big deal. Sounds like it. Sounds like it. That event had a large uh, collection of many leather-bound books, <laughs> and his apartment smelled of rich mahogany. Nice. Yes. Yes. But anyway, uh, we are fully in WrestleMania season, the season that Vince McMahon hath wrought, and uh, a lot of things have been wrought by another Vince, and that certain Vince took a walk somewhere last week and we're going to talk about that tonight but first a double shot from the band total defeat
right. So, John, I know the suspense is killing you. What are your <laughs> thoughts on uh, on Vince Russo and TNA mutually parting ways? We actually have Vince Russo on the line. Yep. Vin, all right. You don't sound, why, why don't you sound surprised at all? <laughs> I, uh, I I'm in disbelief. All right, let's let's talk to him, Vince Russo. Thanks Kevin, for coming. Kevin, it's Vince. How are how you doing? How you doing, Kevin? I'm I'm pretty good. How are you holding up? I'm 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 not so good to be honest. And why's that? I got fired from my job. Did you get Wait. fired? I thought it was a mutual parting of ways. I, I didn't think that those chants were that effective. Why does my Vince Russo sound like uh, Hawk from Hawk and Animal? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Why does my Triple H sound like Mike Cain sounds like Undertaker? <laughs> it's okay. My thoughts on Vince Russo by Young John. Yes. Vince Russo is a bad man. <laughs> he killed my favorite wrestling federation. <laughs> I don't like him. Are you talking about Ring of Glory? <laughs> of course. I'm talking about uh, Wrestling Society X, actually. <laughs> uh, Vince Russo. You know, he he had a great run in WWF yeah, back when he was Vic Venom. He worked, <laughs> his, he worked his way up, became the lead head writer. And yeah. uh, he had a lot of good ideas. He, you know, he was apparently he was the one that really created Mr. McMahon and brought him into the spotlight and had him fight Austin. You know, The Rock got big while he was around. Yeah, sure. So. I, I mean, you have to give credit to the the men behind those characters. I mean, basically they were just playing loud versions of themselves, as we've heard so many times. Right. But you're right. He was he was the guy coming up with their segments for the most part. Yeah, so I'll, I, I'll, I'll give the devil his due. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, he definitely was doing something right at some point, and WWE had record ratings under him. You know, and there's a lot of different reasons for this. We talked about this before. It was it was sort of a, the way the wind was blowing as far as TV went at that point, that shock programming was very much in vogue. Uh, you had those guys that were just, just the electric uh, chemistry between – Austin and McMahon and later Austin and The Rock and then Triple H got in the mix and of course Undertaker being there the whole time, uh, Kurt Angle down the line, you know, the, and actually Angle may have been after Russo was gone, but but I guess my point here is there were a lot of talented guys, no shortage of talent, no shortage of uh, audience, you know, that everybody was eager to watch programming like this, but then you look at what happened in WCW and definitely didn't have the same success over there. Uh, no, he, he just tried to do way too much and you can't do that much if there's not a lot of backing. No. You know, it, it seemed like he had all the backing in the world when he uh, had his first run in WWF, but right. once he went to WCW, I think they just thought he was something that he wasn't. Right. Right. That, and I think, yeah. yeah. And these were guys who were, anybody who was going to be of help to him, I guess, you know, had sort of already done what they were going to do. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, he didn't really help them in any way. They they were already either set or had kind of been through uh, the best parts of their, their WCW runs at that point. And as much as we all thought a Judy Bagwell on a pole match was going to be the greatest thing that we ever <laughs> saw, it, it somehow just didn't work that well on camera. It's one of those things that everybody in the back, oh, yeah. This is going to be the stuff of a uh, of legendary programming. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this it's, it's, this this is going to be good. This is going to be like Neil Armstrong on the moon. This is going to be something people. I remember where I was when I saw Judy Bag blow up my pole. <laughs> it's it's like when uh, he had the he had the amazing notion to place the WCW World Title on David Arquette's waist. Yep, and uh, and not long after that, his own waist. So, That's right, he did, he did. Bear, bears repeating that for all the good he did earlier on, and I mean... You know, there there's your shock right there. I feel like there's a there's a line, there's a, there's a thin line between what is shocking in a um, in a pleasing way, where the fans will watch, between what is, and what is shocking in a this-is-so-stupid way. Right, right. And that line was defined when Vince Russo went to WCW. But again, let's be fair here. Uh, Russo did – again, he did come up with some good stuff, obviously, because WWE did very well with him as head writer. If he was completely awful, it wouldn't have succeeded in that that much in spite of him. I totally agree. See, I think he had a leash in uh, WWE, and he was uh, being led the right ways. Once he was in WCW, it was just ridiculous. 
I mean, although, you know, he had great ideas, you know, uh, Oklahoma, I thought was a great idea. Oh, oh yeah, that was that was hilarious. That was wonderful. Except for the part where it wasn't, which was all of it. So. <laughs> I think actually Jamie Dundee was a big fan. Oh, we should to that say segment. that. Yeah, I think he <laughs> liked that. But um, th- supposedly that was mostly Ed Ferrara, and and <laughs> you know they they sort of were two peas in a pod, so it's hard to tell, right. uh, or two peas in a human sentai pod, and they were uh, you know okay. sort of connected at the at the buttocks, those two Ferrara and Russo, and they they were <laughs> it was hard to tell where the uh, one ended and the other began, so to speak. See now now I'm envisioning this this disgusting. Yeah. Abomination. Hopefully no one's just recently eaten their lunch or, or or brunch, if that's your thing. If you live in Brooklyn, that's your thing. If you live in, like, the uh, Williamsburg section, you're wearing a scarf and ha- having brunch and listening to us. <laughs> that was a hipster joke. And you have a neck tattoo. <laughs> no, that's a little different. Oh. <laughs> that's another story. Anyway. So, basically, he, he had some good and some bad. I think it's worth pointing out that a lot of this, the Fire Russo chants – a few people from TNA have said this, that people even who have worked behind the scenes, that some of the things that are getting the fire Russo chance weren't even Vince Russo segments. I think regardless of what he did there, I think we have to acknowledge that there, there were a lot of horrible out-of-practice cooks in that kitchen messing up the dinner. Where, you know? TNA or WCW? TNA. Oh. TNA. A lot of people peeing in that stew. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, TNA is just... TNA reminds me of flat soda. You know, there's still some caffeine in there. It'll get you going, but bleh. Yeah, and occasionally (laughs) very... uh, uh, You are disappointed. I am disappointed. Occasionally it's very gross beyond being disappointing. But what are you going to do? I I think... You know what, Vince Russo will will go on. I mean, he's hopefully been you know good with his money and everything. If he hasn't, I'm sure he can find other work out there. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not wishing the guy any bad luck. I, I certainly don't enjoy a lot of the stuff that he did, but there were other stuff, that he, other things that he did that you know I think the wrestling landscape would be to give the guy some credit. A lot different without him. Absolutely, it seems like the Attitude Era really came. He he had a he had a big hand in that. Absolutely. And I think we have to, again, you had the talent there. And if you hadn't had that talent, that's probably what happened in WCW. Like you said, it's not that the talent wasn't there. It was just that it wasn't set up the same way. He didn't have that leash. Like you said, he didn't have other people or to go back to that, uh, peeing in the stew analogy. <laughs> he didn't have, you know, some good cooks in the kitchen saying, no, no, this is good Throw this out, but stick with this. You're onto something here. Right. Yeah, because I'm sure Vince McMahon was over the shoulder of Vince Russo and FRR. I'm sure they weren't taking the reins of every show. I think we just used ten different analogies here. We used the what the the uh, the horse, the stew, the uh, I, there were seven or eight more. Peeing in the stew. I never heard that one, but I, let's 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 run with it. Yeah. So peeing in the stew. Speaking of peeing in the in the stew, I know this is kind of off topic, but. Uh, Gunner and Garrett Bischoff at uh, against all odds. <laughs> Kevin, that was so horrible. Yeah, I actually missed uh, against all odds. So, t- so tell everyone who, like me, may not have seen against all odds about this match. Gunner versus Garrett Bischoff was just, it was just a singles match. Mm-hmm. It was just two guys wrestling each other, and there was nothing special about it. You had Eric Bischoff in one corner, Hulk Hogan in the other, and it was just very dull and bland. And it was a, it was a clean victory by Gunner. And it was just boring. And that also the clean victory in that case doesn't seem to make a lot of sense when you're building up. Not Bischoff's, at all. Yeah, the junior Bischoff to be so good here. Honestly. And um, yeah, and the four-way match for the title that was kind of boring. The best match was Gazarian and AJ Styles. That was awesome. Yeah, not surprising. Those guys, you know, they they leave it all out there. Yeah, but the, oh. that was it. Like the, <laughs> I didn't see. Uh, I didn't see the. I didn't see anything before that. I saw the end of the Austin Aries match. Right. I, I didn't see Samoa Joe and Magnus uh, win the tag titles, but... Well, I mean, I think you look at this. This is a situation where TNA needs to regroup a little bit here. Mm-hmm. And Vince Russo needs to go and do his thing and regroup. And hopefully everybody gets it all sorted out. And right. this is the best decision for everybody. Yeah. That would make me happy. That would that would be my late Christmas gift here. All right, well, Merry Christmas yeah. to that. Merry sorry, to, sorry, to, to, sorry to run us off topic here. No, no, no. That's good. Um, I'd like to talk about more uh, more stuff created by events, if that's okay. 
Yes. And that, and that being another Vince, and that would be Vince Lombardi. The <laughs> Vince Lombardi trophy. Well, he didn't create the trophy. That that doesn't work on so many levels. Yes, go on. Shane McMahon, <laughs> the son of Vince Lombardi. Okay. Not in other circles is Vince McMahon. <laughs> Uh, he was in WWE. <laughs> she, uh, yes, okay. I, I'm sorry. I can't. They can't all be winners. About 98 out of 100 jokes are going to flop. <laughs> sort of like a Vince Russo. Okay, no, 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 no. We're done picking on him. Best of luck to you, buddy. Anyway, Shane McMahon was once in WWE. Did you know this? <laughs> yes. I did. I think. I think. <laughs> do you remember, Shane? Do you, do you remember when you were in WWE? Yeah. That was cool. <laughs> That's uh, from the Chris Farley show. And and remember when everyone said you were going to TNA? Yeah. That was a hoax, right? <laughs> yes, yes, I wasn't really in TNA. Oh, good. <laughs> the hell? <laughs> I don't know. I had fun with it. <laughs> now, before we, before we get into the serious stuff, I remember Shane Best as being the commentator for WWF Attitude, the video game. <laughs> really? Him and Jerry Lawler. And, and then I think, didn't Shane wrestle Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania three? <laughs> I think he refed at WrestleMania six. Yeah, I think he did. That's his first appearance. He refed during the ninety one Rumble too. I'm exactly. I'm reading that yeah. off of. Wikipedia. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I did some research on Wikipedia earlier, but I honestly didn't remember what his on camera debut was. And he was it was his name was not Shane McMahon. What did they book him as? Shane Stevens. Shane Stevens. That's funny. Well, anyway, um, <laughs> Shane McMahon is, uh, yeah, he's doing a lot of other stuff now, and we'll, we'll get into that. He's, he's sort of moved on with his life. But, of course, a lot of memorable moments in WWE with him, and, of course, all the, the daredevil stunts, the you know, elbow drop off the top of the, the set, uh, his, his feuds with Kurt Angle with Kane. By the way, that Kurt Angle match at King of the Ring, I rewatched that about, a month ago, it was on the Best of the King of the Ring DVD. Uh -huh. Do you remember that he was thrown at that glass twice on the way back and landed on his head both times? Yes, because it wasn't breaking, right? Right. And then Kurt just sort of threw him through face first where he had nothing to like break it, to yes. break his uh, impact with. And the glass, of course, was designed to break. It wasn't proper glass, but both guys still bled hitting into it. Absolutely. It was, it was legit blood. So, I mean, Shane McMahon did some crazy stuff that he absolutely did not have to do. He went out there and sacrificed his body just to get a reaction from the fans. And I think for someone who could have very easily just been a suit, you have to give it up for him in that case. Yes. I, you know what? I was jaded growing up because I, I didn't like Shane growing up. I thought it was annoying. He did the whole the same little jump rope skit yeah, yeah, yeah. when he came to the ring and it just bugged the hell out of me. And him, him just trying to be hardcore for the sake of being hardcore. Looking back, though, he was pretty hardcore. Jumping off that set is insane. I don't care what you're landing on. Right. Absolutely. And it's not like he was landing on pillows. He was landing on cardboard that had, like, just enough give in it. Exactly. So and then <laughs> uh, beneath that cardboard is, I'm assuming, just a hard arena floor. Right. Right. Probably a few feet down. But, yes. again, who... You know that's that's crazy, especially for the the the, the son of son? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm just trying to think of how much Vince said he was worth. The son of a blah 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 millionaire or billionaire or trillionaire or whatever he said he was. I think it was blah 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 billionaire. I'm worth the national debt. Damn it! <laughs> I'm worth blah 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 millions. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> yes. Yes. Blah, 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 millions. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> Shane McMahon, apart from that, the interesting thing to me is that Shane McMahon was the heir apparent to the McMahon kingdom. It seemed like when everything was said and done, Shane would take over for his dad. And he was the guy who was really just a hardcore wrestling fan who w had been groomed for that position seemingly for years, got out there and actually wrestled, was well established as an on air character. Some people, such as yourself, weren't a big fan, but other people loved him. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed to me like he would have been the perfect fit there to re replace his dad eventually. And then things started to sort of go in the other direction. And it, you remember these rumors, right, that yes. Shane was going to be groomed. And I mean, 
were you at all surprised then when Shane just took off and left the family company, walked away from the family business and started out on his own? Absolutely. Yeah, I think this is around the time where um, I think WWE was going to try and jump into the MMA uh, arena. And right. I think they, I think I remember Shane was really, was really pushing for it. And maybe that was the push. Maybe that was the, uh, the breaking point. I don't know. I'm not really too familiar with, uh, how he left, how he resigned and left, um, right. Titan sports or WWE, whatever it's called. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I was definitely surprised. There was a rumor that that was a big thing that led to his resignation, that he wanted more involvement in MMA, and Vince just didn't see it. Uh, if that was the case, I'm a little bit surprised that Shane hasn't had more involvement in MMA since his leaving WWE. Mm-hmm. But it's possible. I mean, I know he had a couple little pet projects that didn't seem to pan out in the way he might have liked. I know he was the big proponent behind bringing ECW back as a brand, and we all saw what happened there. That can have been what he had envisioned. Not at all, no. <laughs> I think he 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 had the vision, but somebody else took care of the rest because uh, that couldn't have been what he was imagining. No, no, especially given, like you said, he was very much immersed in this hardcore wrestling culture and you know, taking moves from Rob Van Dam and uh, just taking these bumps that he did. He was someone who obviously had a lot of respect for that style of wrestling, and I can't imagine he would have wanted to bring it back just to kill it. <laughs> And that might give away who uh, probably <laughs> was behind it going down a little differently. But, yeah, I don't know. but he left the company and he's doing well on his own. Uh, because interestingly enough, when Shane O'Mac was still with WWE, uh, supposedly he was the one that was pushing out and getting WWE to be more of a global entity. To be aired in all these different countries, which of course ultimately led to the tours and WWE being bigger abroad now than it is – uh, domestically, or at least as far as growth is concerned. And Shane McMahon supposedly sort of led the way for that. And appropriately enough, he's now with a company uh, that was called China Broadband initially. And I I don't believe he started it, but he, he sort of jumped on board, and it was a broadband internet and cable company. It's now called You On Demand. This is a company that expands into China that helps – different uh, multimedia companies get their products to Chinese audiences through cable, through internet. And China is, I believe, the leading growing consumer of different multimedia, uh, wow. different TV shows and, and internet products. I mean, which makes sense because just because of the population. Mm-hmm. And Shane McMahon is getting all these different companies, including, I read something about Warner, and there was some kind of connection between Warner and You On Demand, and he was helping them get uh, different movies and different on-demand products to Chinese audiences. And, and Shane, there was this quote from him in an interview just saying that he had this vision of China having all these consumers because there's so much piracy that goes on in China. And just yeah. for him to be that forward thinking, that to me is like worlds ahead of a lot of what you see coming out of WWE. Yeah, definitely. It's, that's streets ahead. Yeah. So <laughs> streets, ahead. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. It's just interesting to see where people t- – how people take their experience and they go somewhere else because he's certainly not uh, in TNA and he's certainly not in high school gym signing autographs. You know, he, he When he left WWE, it was because he really was not concerned with wrestling at that point. And have some uh, suspicions about why that might have been apart from the MMA thing. But I think we need to take a break and play a few songs here. And we actually have a few coming up. We have music from, well, three bands, three very short songs. So – uh don't blink or you might miss them. Uh, blink your ears, I guess I mean. Young John, anything else to add about Shane McMahon before we go to this break? No, I, I blinked. That, did I miss one of the songs? I think you missed two of them at least. Uh, here's Damn three. it. On Bowling Shoe Handsome. Just say, can't take this away. 
Okay, so there we had three songs. Uh, well, most recent, what, well, first we had Hold Tight with the song Can't Take This Away, then the band Shang Lang with Caught In Between, and finally we had Third Year Freshman doing Popular Girl. So Whoa. Ho, ho, ho. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Hello, ladies. Well, well, well. Yep. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just no. So... Another reason, young John. Well, okay. okay. So, what what else do you think might have left to uh, left led to Shane leaving WWE? Yeah, you know, I don't know. I I really think maybe it was just the uh, the MMA thing, or maybe he just thought he wasn't uh, his input wasn't being counted. Maybe I don't know. Okay, input. So, like, if if his input wasn't being taken into consideration, whose was? I would assume Vince and Stephanie. If, Stephanie. if they're the two that are still around. <laughs> Damn it, Stephanie. Ding, ding, ding. Steph O'Mac, Triple H, now the, the quote-unquote COO, yes. uh, said on Raw last week, this is all going to be mine someday. Uh, I don't know if that's um, – not, that's not a direct quote, but he <laughs> said something along those lines. Is that true, though? I mean, is, is it going to be all his one day? Well, I think his and Steph's, I think they're next to the line, and they are going to be the heirs to the McMahon kingdom. And I think over time there were there were more disagreements in vision between the elder McMahon and his son Shane. And I think even though, of course, Steph and Triple H, I'm sure, have some different opinions than Vince McMahon, and you, you see the product changing a little bit, I think they have a lot in common with them and a lot of the same mentality. You know, certain things are good, like like – Big guys are always going to get reactions. Like <laughs> yes. Jacked up guys, yeah. Um, you know this old school mentality certainly. Um, and, and of course, there's a few twists on that. And again, we still see the product changing. And I, and I really think we see Steph and Triple H increasingly involved in the day to day operations. But I do think that the and the word was always that Shane and Steph had different opinions on things. And I think you look, and he left, and one can only imagine, I mean, it is suspicion on my part, but that he was a little bit frustrated with how things were going. Yeah, it seems like he wanted to be, he wanted to take the the, the road less traveled. He didn't want to do what Stephanie and Vince and uh, Triple H want to do. And like you said, is they, they just want to have the big guy against the big guy. Right. It seemed like Shane was more about the, uh, you know, the MMA. He was all into Steve Blackman when he was there. He liked the hardcore. He liked having guys come in and steal the spotlight when they're not that stereotypical, you know, big bulky Batista or Batiste two, or Batiste three or whatever is going on now. And <laughs> I'm assuming that he was probably a big lucha fan. I'm, uh, I'm sure if Shane was around, that 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 would have taken flight as well. Right. That's, uh, I don't know, all good points. And I think he had his taste versus what the company has traditionally done. And, of course, they've always done a little bit of everything, but I don't know. I think Shane probably had some different views. The ECW thing, the MMA thing, uh, the high-flying, the hardcore. These are all things that WWE is not emphasizing. I'm sure it wasn't just a small creative dispute. I'm, it was probably, if this was what was going on, it was more his voice not being heard than anything. And I think we see uh, Stephanie and Triple H. That's me uh, re 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 reaping the benefits. Uh, That's your Stephanie? Yeah, it was a pretty good uh, Steph, wasn't it? it sounds really? just like her. Yeah, yeah, it does. <laughs> I could hear the bass reverberating off her fake, well, you know. She had a fake smile, I know. She was very, very uh, shallow. Yes. <laughs> but I'm very interested to see how Triple H plays out as a character in the next year or so and whether he steps back into the ring where people play by his instructions <laughs> and so on. I don't think we're going to see Shane back anytime soon. He's doing well on his own. Stephanie McMahon's doing well for, for her part, and her and Triple H are popping out. I think they have seven kids now. 17. 
Yeah, at least they are. They're going to be the new Duggars. Is that it? Is that the name Duggar? I think so. All right, Hacksaw Jim Duggar. Hacksaw right, Jim Duggar. <clears throat> well, Young John, do you have anything to add about Vince's and uh, and their spawns, their creations? No, no. The things that have sprung from their loins, both literally and metaphorically speaking. I think we touched on everything. I, I think we touched all their loins. Yeah. Oh, oh, sexy. I yeah, think but, we've, literally, yeah, but... we've literally covered the entire lives of Vince Russo and Vince McMahon. And yes, we have. Even even though we talked very little about Vince McMahon, we've talked about the complete lives of his family. I think so, everybody's talked at length about Vince McMahon. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we could we'll do a a twelve part biographical series on him one of these weeks. Yes, we will. And everybody will enjoy that. All right. Well, I think we've wrapped up pretty nicely here. Let's go to one more song. That's right. We get another song, and uh, we'll come back and stare. Well, that, I think you had a couple things you wanted to talk about, right? In the in the world of pop culture. In the world of pop culture, yes. All right. Well, stick stick around for them. We'll be right back after the song from Drug Church. <laughs>
Lies Latham by the band Drug Church. And it certainly it, was, yes. It, it is a fact that that's what that was. And we have returned for some uh, pop culture chit-chat. So uh, let's let's hear it, young John. What, first of all, do, do, what, what do you want to talk about first? These topics? Did you want to talk about your weekly background? Well, I want to talk about something, and I, I know what your reaction is going to be. It's the same as everyone else's reaction. Rihanna and Chris Brown. It, it sounds like they're on again. And they've been on again, off again for about a month now, but it seems like they're they're back on. Do you... And it's just sending a wonderful, positive message to all the women out there, to all the young women growing up. Did you see this Tumblr that was out there? No. With uh, people reacting to Chris Brown at the Grammys. There yeah. were a collection of 25 tweets from all young women saying things along the lines of, hey, Chris Brown can hit me if he, if he wants to. What's she complaining about? I let him hit me. And for the most part, it seems like horrible double entendre, sort of insensitive jokes. And then like a couple of them are like, I'd let him punch me in the face if it meant being with him. And I was like, oh, wow. People are just very much out of uh, out of step with what's going on. Uh, have, have you heard of um, – apparently he tried picking somebody up like at a Grammy party, and yeah. his, his line was, can I get your number? I promise I won't beat you. Ah, oh, John. God damn it, dude. It's, <laughs> that's real? No, no, it's real. No, it's not. Yes, it is. I'm not making no, that up. No, it's not. I'm not making that up. Really? Yes. Wow. He, that guy, you know, he's been off the handle. I mean, he flipped out on a talk show set last year yep. when he was finally allowed to talk in public. Yep. Um, he flipped out on Twitter earlier, well, last week. Mm -hmm. And, man, just he does not have a filter in between his mind and his mouth or his mind and, you know, if he's hitting people, his mind and his, his hands, I guess. But it's just like, you know what, that, that kind of stuff, there's few things that are less disgusting than, than – physically attacking a woman abusing a woman like i i know we have like a sort of like a lighthearted show here but that that stuff's disgusting and for somebody to go out and be on the grammys the show that surrounding his the initial controversy the show where he you know it, it happened prior to a, pr the grammy performance yep. three years ago mm -hmm. and but by, by the way there was a post from the grammys saying that we were a little unsure about having him back because we were sort of the victim of what happened before the, yes, because the, the Grammys were the victim. The Grammys were – I read that. I had five simultaneous aneurysms when I read that. <laughs> I, I, I cannot believe how stupid and just – oh, man. I'm having another one right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, let me play devil's advocate here. No, I'm just kidding. There's no way to do that. All right, let me just <laughs> – let me end it no, on I'm this. I'm just kidding. He's a horrible person. <laughs> let, let me end it on this, though, Kevin. Yeah. He's only 22 years old. Really? He's only 22. Wow. So that happened when he was like 20. You know what? And I think you know people can certainly turn it around and and do better things with their lives. But uh, I'll tell you what, that guy never really had a serious uh, period of time to do that to go out and seek seek out help. He's yeah. obviously still a little like still flying off the handle about stuff. Yeah. And basically if he, if nobody ever calls him out on it, you know, and anytime anyone's called him out on it, like a couple days later there's like a mysterious apology. Oh, I'm sorry for saying that. No. You know what? The first thing you said was right. Like Jay Z originally said something, I think. Uh God. Usher, I think. A couple other people have said things and then and then said oh i'm sorry for if i offended anyone with this no you called out someone for for hitting a woman yeah. that's pretty much the right thing to do so, yeah well uh, jay-z and chris brown they're still kind of added a little bit mm -hmm. but i i think they're on the same i think they're both rockefeller i could be really wrong about that but i'm pretty sure they're both on the same label and jay-z basically owns that label so I think he tries to keep himself in check, but at the same time, he's like, you're ridiculous. But right. let, let's not dwell on this topic. My, my only other topic was that uh, Adele won a bunch of Grammys. As predicted. As predicted by everybody that uh, owns this, this, uh, the sense of hearing. Yeah. <laughs> everyone, everyone saw this coming down the street in a Mack truck with the high beams on. And she was, you know, good for her, man. She that's very rare too that someone will win every Grammy they're nominated for. Would she go six for six? Yep. Yep. 
And, and uh, she I... sung after having yeah. throat surgery, which... Which is super risky and stupid, but... I agree. I, hopefully she had a good good surgeon, man, because that's... She, she that's... thanked her surgeon during one of her um, acceptance speeches. I did, I did catch that, and I didn't watch the whole thing, but I, there were some parts I definitely liked. I, I, I really think... I loved the Beatles medley at the end, the side two medley from Abbey Road, Paul McCartney doing that with his, his regular band. Um, but, I, and I mean, this brings it back to the sort of show we do here. And it's really kind of funny because I like to play all these Indian underground things and sort of have that spirit going on here. But we're talking about this global conglomerate WWE 99.9% of the time. <laughs> and here we're talking about the Grammys, which is the opposite of this this awesome music that we play on here in that it's very much backed by major labels and, and not underground or DIY or whatever you want to call it. And you have the Grammys again, which were, are the opposite of that. And then you had Dave Grohl. Did you catch Dave Grohl's speech? No. Grammys. Mm -mm. Dave Grohl said something along the lines of, you know, we went back to basics for this. We recorded our, our last album to tape. We used the producer we used uh, when I was in Nirvana and we recorded this in my garage, and it's sort of like, you know, David Grohl's garage is probably as big as as the house I'm in right now. No, I think he went back to his old house's garage. I think really? I did. I think I did read about this. Okay. Well, still, I would have to say, even if it is an old garage, do you really think he used, you know, bottom of the line? Of, you know what I mean? It's a very yeah. professional sounding record. This is not something the average person can can handle. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, his heart was in the right place, but it just, yeah, I just found that all a little funny. And I mean, I don't, I get a little bored with the Foo Fighters, but I mean, their first album's really good. Um, and I, I like a song here or there from them since then, but just, I just had to point that out. Um, so you have a background? I do. It's, uh, Angelina Jolie. Okay. Oh, let's go mainstream once again. Okay. And if yeah, you look at if you look yeah, at the... we don't have to be totally underground. Okay, I I feel like I recognize this. Is this kind of an older picture? Yeah, it's an older picture. See, I, I just saw a picture of her earlier today. Her in like this in a dress, and she looked amazing. But I can't find the picture. So mm -hmm. I saw this picture, and I thought it was interesting because um, it's just her face and her hair, but she's still ridiculously gorgeous. As ridiculously gorgeous as this program. Yeah. Some of my transitions are better than others. That, that, that's all I got for you today, Kevin. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, I think we actually went a tiny bit long today, so thanks everybody for sticking with us. Thanks to all of our guests. Yes, Vince Russo, you did a great job. <laughs> no, he didn't. So, don't, even, don't even. No, he didn't. <laughs> I, I wish you would visit us more often. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll relay the message. <laughs> no, you won't. I won't. I'm not going to do it. You won't. You won't relay that message now. <gasps> oh, I won't, won't I? So what you did there? Good night, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Leave us feedback at pullingshoehandsome at gmail.com or on the comments section at thebradyhicks.com. For Young John, I am Kevin McElvaney, and we will see you here next week on Bowling Shoe Handsome. So don't ask me how I am. Don't ask me how.